Once upon a time, not so very, very long ago, there was a young man. Um, he was successful. He was uh, very, very skilled. He was a carpenter. And he lived in a small town. Um, there was a legend around this town about a, a lost cave. And he'd always wondered about the, the lost cave. He was helping a friend uh, restore an old, old house and he was tearing down a, a wall in this old house and as he uh, demolished the wall, he found an envelope that had been hidden in this wall for many, many decades. And he took the envelope, didn't think much about it, but he kept it and he took it home and he threw it in a pile. Uh, Several days later, he got an opportunity to go through it, and he opened it up, and he couldn't tell exactly what it was, but he thought that it might be a map, a map to a hidden cave. So a few weeks later, he had a day off, and he went to the map. He followed it, and even though the undergrowth, you know, the, the Overburden had grown up quite a bit. The landmarks were still there, and he could still follow it. And he was able to find, behind a bush, an entrance. And he walked in, and he was able to go in, and it got narrower and narrower. And just about at a time when he thought he was going to have to give up, it started opening up bigger again. And he went in, and there in front of him was a huge cavern. And he got the feeling that it had been many, many decades since anyone had been in this cavern. And he shined his light around, and he was fascinated at being in this large cavern. And he walked around. He was on his way back out, and he noticed kind of a little nook, a little area that you wouldn't notice if unless your light happened to just catch it right, and you could only notice it on your way back out. And he walked over to it, and once again, it was kind of a narrow opening, and he followed it. It got narrow and narrow, and he thought he was going to have to give up, but just about then it opened up, and he went into a second large cavern. And this was just as beautiful as the first one, and he shined his light around, and he, he walked around in that larger cavern, and he was getting ready to go, and he scanned his light and he saw a glint. It was a little sparkle and he shined it back and he didn't see it. He went over and he looked and he looked. He saw it again and he finally reached down and he picked it up. It's covered with mud and he cleaned it off and brushed it up and cleaned it up and he realized, oh my goodness, this is an uncut diamond. A raw diamond. The thing must have been 20 carats. He realized that this was worth an an enormous amount of money. And, and he thought, I wonder if there are any more. He put it in his pocket and he began to search and he searched all around that second cavern and he didn't see any more. And he went back out into the first cavern and he looked around in there and he didn't see it. And he thought, well, at least I found this one thing that, and he knew that he had found something that was likely worth more than he could make or earn as a carpenter in eight or 10 years or more. And he put his hand in his pocket and only felt a large hole. It was as if this diamond had eaten a hole in the bottom of his pocket. And so he started retracing his steps every place he'd been. And he looked and he looked and he looked. He looked down on the ground. He looked all over. He went back into the, the second cavern and he looked all through in there. And he looked and he looked and he never could find it. He finally gave up that night and he went home, but he turned around and he came back the next day and he became obsessed with looking for that lost large diamond. And he didn't find it and he didn't find it. And he came back the next day and the next and the next. And then he got fired from his job because he hasn't showed up for his job as a carpenter. But he didn't care because who cares about a mundane job? Because he knew that this gem was worth many years pay. So he continued to look. 
And then his house was foreclosed because he hadn't made any payments. But he didn't care. He set up a tent closer to the entrance to the lost cave. And he lived in the tent. And he continued to search. And he continued to search. And then it was like an instant went before him. And he realized that he had been searching for 20 years. He looked and realized that the next day would be 20 years that he had been searching for this diamond. And the, the revelation came to him of what he had done. He had spent probably a quarter of his life searching for this elusive diamond that he had lost. And he vowed, one more day, I'm going to look for one more day, and then I'm going to give up. And so he returned the next morning early, and he searched on his hands and knees for 18 hours without a break. He continued his search, and finally, he just fell on the ground, and he started to laugh. And he realized how ridiculous this had been. He had given up everything. He had lost his friends. He had never pursued a relationship. He'd given up so much in pursuit. He rolled on his back and continued to laugh almost maniacally. But then... He found his gem. No, he didn't find the diamond. The gem that he found was the realization of how important the things were that he had given up for these 20 years. And that maybe they were worth far more than this diamond. That perhaps he would have met someone. He could have married could have had kids. He missed soccer games and he missed school plays and he missed loving friendships. He missed the ability to give back to the universe that skill that he had as a carpenter and to give to other people. And he laid there and just laughed maniacally. Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to the Alaska Center for Spiritual Living. Jenna, that was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Two magnificent voices at the same time. I, I don't know what the schedule is. I've turned that over to the universe, otherwise known as Linda. And <laughs> she'll tell me what to do. She does that a lot. But I would love to hear you and Faith do a duo, mm -hmm. duet, <sighs> two beautiful voices. Uh, but thank you very, very much. Welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming out today. Beautiful, perfect, fair weather, isn't it? Yes. Everybody knows it's been to the Alaska Fair. We got the weather for the fair. So uh, thank you all for coming out. And welcome to those of you who are watching on YouTube. That number is growing exponentially. Last month, Heather gave me the data, 2,880 some minutes of people watching YouTube. Uh, I think 2,200 of them were for the week that Cindy talked. But we don't care. It's, it's good. Uh, that averages out to 29 people a week. So we probably have, I don't know, I'm going to say we've got 80 in here today. It's about our average. That really is more like 110 because we've got that many people watching. So uh, welcome to those of you on, on YouTube well, as well. Thank you for, for tuning in today. I got a call uh, early in this week uh, from a practitioner. Uh, who said, Don, do you realize how negative you were last week? I said, what do you mean? Yeah, you were talking about your little puppy, and it was so negative. And I think maybe in my own kind of twisted way, whatever, I, I was trying to elicit sympathy 
for the uh, experience of a new puppy and all of the oh chewed up shoes and the oh, mistakes and the, all the things that go with this puppy. And for those of you that don't know, the, the puppy's name is Joy. <laughs> well, we already had the grand dog Grace and our mission statement is teaching with grace and joy. So I figured we had to have joy. So, um, and joy is certainly that. That's why we've got all of this. And I certainly don't mean to talk negatively about joy. And that's why we came up with the idea this week for a talk. And the title of the talk today is Embracing Joy. And it can certainly mean that wonderful little puppy joy as well. My three points today are, no man can take your joy. Number two, you can't change others. You can only change yourself. And number three, the divine current is for you. So number one, no man can take your joy. You must give it away. We all have opportunities every single day to get frustrated and to get upset. And it happens all the time to us. Lost car keys. You can get disappointed in your friends. Somebody is rude to us. The traffic is backed up. You're late for an appointment and that's the day that the Department of Transportation, you know, the, the road crews, in all their infinite wisdom, decide that's the day that they're going to stripe the Seward Highway and you've got one lane all the way from Diarman downtown. You know, <laughs> Frustration. Don't let these things keep you from seeing the gift of each and every day. Sometimes we get an assist in, um, in holding on to our joy. I think it was a couple of years ago, I was... Um, shopping over at the Diamond Center. I know it was since I've been minister here because I snuck away from here to go over to the Diamond Center thinking that it wouldn't be crowded. I could get in then and get some shopping done. And I got over there and there was not a parking place anywhere in the, the Diamond Center. I was in the front part. I was in the side part. I was in the back part. And I mean, every single parking place was filled. The Walmart lot was parked. It looked like if you went all the way over to the car dealership, there might be a few places way over there. But I was in that first series of rows uh, next to the south entrance, and I went down, and I had seen a guy with, a, I think, three little kids, and they were parading out to his car, and I saw him uh, up in front of me, and he was opening the trunk and putting his treasures in the trunk of his car, and, oh, he's going to be leaving. So I patiently parked, and I kind of put on my blinker indicating I was going to take his place when he got out, and uh, sure enough, he loads up the kids, and he adjusted his mirror, and he had the kids' seat belts, and... And finally, I saw the, you know, backup lights come on, and he started to back out, and he came my way, so I backed up a little bit, and he backed out. And just as he backed out, a guy came the other way, and whoop, slipped right into that spot. And I just was tempted to give away my joy <laughs> at the scene. If... If Mrs. Fleming would have been with me, shit would have been the time, but that's not very ministerial. <laughs> but then I got an assist, a, an assist in holding on to that joy. Because as I sat there ready to glare at this guy that took my parking place, he got out. And he was 6'4 and full of muscle. And in that moment, I realized, you know, I could use a little exercise. I wouldn't mind walking from the car dealership. That won't hurt. So I get a little assist in keeping my joy. Be happy and quit giving away your joy. Uh, point number two, you can't change others. You can only change yourself. What it kept playing in my mind when I heard that, there's an old Ricky Nelson song uh, it's about a garden party, and one of the lyrics is, uh, uh, you, can't please every, you can't please everyone, so you got to please yourself. 
And I think there's a lot of truth in that. We're, we're never going to please everybody. The best we can hope for is to at least please ourselves. Not all of your coworkers are going to celebrate your successes. Um, as you step into this philosophy and we start using the principles that we've learned, sometimes people start enjoying more success in their careers. They start doing things a little bit differently and whatnot, and they start getting the promotion because they've got a better attitude. They're better suited to do that, and they move in and they get the promotion. Well, not all of your coworkers are going to support you in that. Some of those coveted that position, that promotion. Not all of your family is going to celebrate your achievements. Um, I know a family and they have a, an aunt, um, her name is Elizabeth and she's done very well and she's risen through the ranks of, of government and has done real well and the family behind her back calls her Queen Elizabeth. Not everybody in your family is going to support you and your achievements. Not all of your friends are going to celebrate your happiness. When we get into that place and we can feel it in here. People talk about, I didn't like coming here at first because everybody's so happy. And I, I didn't know if I fit in. And not everybody is comfortable around us when we can step into and accept our joy and not give it away. That negative person in the office may be there for the next 20 years. You are the one that has to change. You can't find joy in situations and in other people. The joy has to come from within. We can't find happiness outside. We can't find our 20 carat diamond outside. The joy has to come from within. The uh, profound philosopher George Burns <laughs> once said, whoops, whoops. wrong quote. <laughs> Happiness is having a close-knit, loving, supporting family living in another city. <laughs> point number three, the divine current is for you. Ernest Holmes, now I've got to write. This is out of the Essential Ernest Holmes, which we have that class starting this fall. It's an awesome class. Karen uh, Valera Sherman is going to teach it. Uh, she's been talking with me, and I, I see pages of curriculum falling away and being replaced by new Karen curriculum. So I think it's going to be an exciting class. Essential Ernest Holmes. Ernest Holmes said, to live by inspiration means to sense the divine touch in everything. To enter into the spirit of things, to enter into the joy of living. Miracles abound. I thought about, well, where can I come up with some miracles? I've got books of miracles. And miracles happen to us, through us, all the time every single day. But some of the best examples of miracles come from uh, the Bible, from the Hebrew Scriptures and from the Christian Gospels. Uh, and the one that strikes me, I was too bad Lance isn't here today, he could correct me if I've got some of this wrong. But Abraham was 99 and his wife Sarah was 90 when they had their son Isaac. I, I think that's a miracle. Some people doubt it. I don't know. But if it's true, it's a miracle. God gives us miracles all of the time. And like I say, I've got books of them. I just happened to open up a book. And a lady by the name of Wilda Laman told a great story. Her husband, Randy, uh, woke up in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning. He rolled over and he shook her up and he said, you got to take me to the hospital. I think I'm having a heart attack. She looked over and he was pale. He was sweating. And 
he said, you got to get me now. And she says, I'll call 911. He says, no, we don't have time. We got to get there now. So she helped him out to the car. She put him in the car and he slumped over and had, was losing consciousness. He was not going to make it in the hospital. It was like 15 miles away. And she didn't know what else to do. So she slammed the car in gear. She punched it and off she went as fast as she could go. She went about a mile. She came over a hill and came down and there was an intersection and at the intersection there was an ambulance. So she pulled up and she said, my husband's having a heart attack. I need your help. And the paramedics jumped out into the ambulance. He went, they're checking his vitals, they're doing the stuff, they're giving him IVs and doing all the other stuff. And the paramedic says, follow us. And off they went. They got him to the hospital just in the nick of time, and they saved him. Later, she talked to her husband, Randy, and he said, how did you ever get me here on time? She said, don't you remember? He said, no. And she said, yeah, it was, it was just a miracle. We came down the hill, and there was an ambulance there waiting for us. Did you call them? Well, no. I was in a hurry to get there. They had had a report of an accident at that intersection and the paramedics had been dispatched to that intersection for this horrible automobile accident that never occurred. They even called back to verify they were in the right place. Yep, you're in the right place. No accident. At that time, she came screeching up. The divine is working for us. Yes, we have trials, we have tribulations, we have difficulties in our life. But overall, the divine is working for us. The divine is paving the way. The divine is making it easier and better for us. Now, like I say, that doesn't mean that we don't have the challenges and things in our life, because we do. But it is those challenges that make us stronger. And once again, returning to uh, Hebrew scriptures for, for an example, but uh, Joseph and, and the coat of many, many colors, he was the, what was he, Lance? Really miss him. Uh, I think he's the, <laughs> the 11th son. And, but he was, oh, who was he? He was the son of Jacob. He was Jacob's favorite son. And, and he was favored, way favored, the last son. And the other brothers didn't like it, you know. And so they decided they were going get, to get rid of Joseph. And they took his multicolored coat. They threw him in a pit. And then he ended up selling him into slavery. But he went through, Joseph went through all of those things. He was, in, he was held in slavery. He was sent to Egypt. He went through all of these things. And each one of those things made him stronger. And he was then able to interpret the Pharaoh's dream. And the Pharaoh put him in charge of all the stores. Well, the famine hit, just as he had predicted. His family is starving to death. And they decide, well, there's only one place we can go to get some grain. That's going to be Egypt. Let's go to Egypt. Well, guess who's holding the grain stores? So those brothers had to go suck up to Joseph. They didn't even recognize him at first. But he, he went along with it, and he ended up giving them grain. But the point is, is that those difficulties made him stronger, and they made him able to withstand all that. And the same thing happens with us. Years ago, uh, me and I, some of my buddies got this great idea that there was this it was like the cave. There was this elusive steelhead run on Kodiak. Nobody knew about this steelhead run on Kodiak. Uh, but we were going to go find this unheard of, the most western steelhead run in the world. And we were going to go find it. Uh, and we did. There is a run on western Kodiak. It's not real big and you've got to time it right. Well, we were headed back to our camp. There were four of us. My old buddy Dirk and me, and then uh, one guy, he's a big burly football player like guy. He was probably the guy in the parking lot. Big, big guy. Uh, uh, but he had a bum knee, and he was strong as an ox up until about 2 in the afternoon, and then that knee would start giving him, and he'd slow down, and then there was an older gentleman. Uh, so we were headed back to camp. It was late in the afternoon. We were tired, and instead of being a nice sweeping oxbow turn, this river made like a real sharp bend, and as we walked up river, we came around that bend. The bear was coming downwind. We were going upwind. We came around and came face to face with a huge Kodiak brown bear, 
And we were like two fly rods away from that bear. I mean, we were 20 feet away from that bear. And the bear stood up, and God, I can still remember this. You know, it peeled back its lips, and its fangs were all out, and, and it stood up, and it, oh, wow. It was, and old Dirk, I got to give that guy credit. I mean, just as calm as could be. And he said, oh, bear, it's just, just us. We're just coming through. This is your highway, bear. We know. It's okay. We're backing away, bear. We're backing away. And he slowly backed away. And we got away from that trail. The bear dropped down on all fours and gave us kind of a dirty look and walked on downstream. <laughs> Whoa, Dirk, I said, that was amazing. I said, how in the world did you ever have the composure to be able to handle that? I mean, that was incredible. Yeah, I said, that wasn't a big deal. He said, we could always run. I said, what? You can't run from a bear like that. That thing's faster than a thoroughbred horse. You, you, running triggers their predatory response. We couldn't run. Donnie says, we don't need to outrun the bear. All we're going to do is outrun those two. <laughs> it doesn't mean we don't get challenges in our lives. It's how we approach it. Okay. Conclusion, final point today. <laughs> I didn't tell the entire story of our friend the carpenter, so let's go back and visit our friend the carpenter. For We're going to tell the rest of the story. <laughs> our carpenter friend is lying there on his back in the cave. And he's come to the awareness of what's really important. And I know that some of you are going to say, is thinking that I was going to say as soon as he quit looking, then he would find the, the diamond. But no, the true gem was his awareness of what was really important. And what really constituted the joy in his life. But as he laid there laughing, he had his light by his side and and he had the relief that could only come from stepping away from a 20-year obsession. And he kind of shined his light up at the ceiling, and he gasped. And what he was looking at in the ceiling was a sea of sparkles. There, suspended above him, were thousands of raw, uncut diamonds. He had spent 20 years looking down at the ground for one when he had been surrounded by a fortune for all of those years. So the takeaway that I have for you today is question. What is surrounding you that you may be missing by paying attention to the little difficulties in your life and the limitations that you've learned to accept. And two, what might you stumble upon if you surrender to a higher principle of life? And so it is with this awareness of a higher principle within our lives that are operating through us at all times. I invite my colleagues, the practitioners, to join me in holding our congregation in this place of love and light knowing that the joy that is inherent in our lives is ours. And we are the ones that give it away. But we don't have to. We can hold on to that joy. We can step back from the compulsion to keep looking for that which we think is necessary for our happiness outside of ourselves. And we can know that that joy is within us now and always. And it is in every situation. We may have the appearance of disease, the appearance of something other than health, when we know that our natural condition is one of health, one of vitality, and it is that health and vitality that we embrace. So for those that are experiencing disease, we just simply know that for them. For those that are experiencing lack and limitation, not enoughness, we just know 
that it is not in the diamonds, that the, the true gem is in the simple life. The true gem is in our ability to love one another. It's in our ability to, to see the God in everyone else, to see the namaste. And we know that as we come together, each and every one of us has expressions of God, that we are that loving, supportive family. And so we just give thanks. We give thanks for our awareness of the power and the presence of God within our lives at every moment. And we just step back and we love one another. We let it go. We let it be. And so it is.